point I want to get across is the fact that cognitive education has mattered from our very earliest days. Second point I'm going to want to do is actually it really ought to be mattering more today as well. But let's see where we go. Uh, we're at, it's actually quite a good time to be looking at this because um, normally when people are writing the history bits, they tend to... Why is this not moving? Okay, we'll go on to plan B. Um, what they tend to do is to start with Robert Owen. Uh, not a bad place to start uh, for some aspects. Um, certainly for education, a man that cared, passionate about education. The bits we tend to gloss over is what he didn't particularly like was cooperatives. As the father of cooperatives. Uh, yeah, basically hated democratic cooperatives um, and also didn't particularly like uh, the idea of uh, you know, people being engaged in that way at all. But he did uh, you know, set us on a path that ended up with, with where we are today. <coughs> so for Owen, as, as an industrialist, one of his great insights was the role of education. He realised that a factory that actually didn't actually have learning in its community would be a weaker factory by every method that you could look at within there. So he was genuinely a social reformer of his time, challenging how people should be treated both in the workplace and also within the community that supports that workplace. And you can actually debate which year we should celebrate it in, but we're about the 200th uh, year of a new view of society, his first major publication. I say that because he actually published it <coughs> long before he got it printed, and you can debate the ones there. But the key thing within this essay, which doesn't mention uh, cooperative at all uh, in there, even though it's very much perhaps the root of, a, of our modern movement, uh, the key thing within there is this concept of uh, the debate between nature and nurture. And what he states in the book, and it was almost his mantra for the rest of his life, uh, in a, a less gender aware time, was the character of man is formed for and not by him absolute passionate belief that actually how we choose to act, how we choose to educate, fundamentally changes the character of people and therefore if you actually want a social reforming movement, you cannot ignore education. We don't come to those, that work ready formed ourselves. Now where Owen will disagree with many other parts of the movement we'll talk on there is he, he was very directional um, in that. Um, so when he planned his villages over of unity and mutual cooperation, uh, which you can see see one here and you've got another one over there and another one down there, that the world will be scattered with these parallelograms of cooperation, which had factories and housing and everything in there, but also had education facilities as well. So he always wrote education in, but it was a benevolent form of education, of doing good to people, um, with a few weird rules, such as you know, young men should always be educated wearing white kilts. I've never <laughs> quite got the grip. That is not, no, not, no longer part of the ICA guidance on education. <laughs> um, and, and Owen did genuinely struggle when he tried to make these real. This is what his, his colony in America, New Harmony, was supposed to look like. The challenges were somewhat greater than the books had suggested at the time. But why Owen really matters to us is one actually the fact he started off by saying you can't ignore education. We may you know, discuss the, you know, the relevant to his, his own models. But secondly, that then got people both <coughs> accepting and rejecting parts of his message. Uh, and there are two key people on that one, one of which I'll, I'll go through there. William Thompson in Ireland, who set up an alternative community. And then the character we'll spend some time on today here, Dr. William King. Now, both of them accepted the idea that society had to fundamentally change um, and brought into that Owen vision. What they completely disagree with him on is how to get there. And what they both believed in, in very different ways was it was no good waiting for the great and the good to fund the radical changing of society because that never happens. The only way to do it was to do it yourself. <laughs> and that became our cooperative movement um, for it. Um, in King's case, uh, this started in Regency Brighton. Um, King was almost an unlikely prophet of this. He was a graduate of both Oxford and Cambridge, a tutor, uh, sorry, physician to the, um, the Prince of Wales, um, tutor to Lady Byron's children. Um, so actually it was you know, from a, a relatively privileged background, um, but very quickly wanted to actually create social reform and realise the path to it. The first part of the second one though, was education, not cooperation. 
So the first thing he did was to found a mechanics institute in Brighton for ordinary working people to have access to education and to learn about social change. And as we work through these characters, note that one, education first, that group he then talked into actually starting to explore the practicalities of cooperation and they, they formed a cooperative store in the town, which he didn't actually always agree with everything they'd done, but came a key bit there. He produced an amazing monthly magazine called The Cooperator, which was a how to do it. And so what he fundamentally changed the visions of Owen for was actually saying, don't wait for somebody to do this for you to build this large community. Pull together whatever meagre savings you have. With that, buy a few goods, sell them to each other, use the profit of that to perhaps buy a store, pull together again there, the profits of that can buy housing, the profits of that can buy land, and you build the community yourself step by step. But what he's very, very clear on that one is that the core of that is education. Corporators cannot attain their ultimate object without an improved education. This knowledge, those of the working classes who begin to understand cooperation, will endeavour to acquire as far as their leisure permits. Isn't that a lovely phrase? And can I, on behalf of William King, thank you all for allowing your leisure to permit you to be here today. So, clearly he would have approved of, uh, of your decisions there and delighting that your, your leisure allows that. For those who want to write our history as it's starting in Rochdale, we miss the richness of this time. It was struggling with very, very little, but realising that education is not an option. It actually is the core of what they do. And these are the growth of cooperatives in King's time. Um, the amazing thing is this is actually going by months. It's actually only over the course of about three years. Um, so from 1827 through to about 1830, we go from nothing the 300 uh, recorded monthly in King's journals um, there. So therefore massive growth of the sector, lots of challenges about making them stable, but all these people buying into, we're going to change our lives together and we're going to use education to do it. So by the time we do get to Rochdale, it becomes not the start, but the turning point. Because what we've got here is a group of people who actually have learned from that generation and are now actually going to create an enterprise that works and a, a cooperative democracy that works, and they will have inherited all of that. You can literally see um, the co a, a bound copy of the cooperator in the Rochdale Museum. So they were learning from that time, and they carry that desire into education. Um, so notice when they're trying, they're saying what they describe what they're trying to achieve, that the society will proceed to arrange the powers of production, distribution, education, and government, completely integrated into what they were doing. Not, we'll run a shop and if you've got anything left over, we might get round to this. This is one of the cores of what they will do. And of course they choose to do that in a time when actually the allocation of reserves to education wasn't legally permitted. They're actually willing to break the law to ensure the education of their members. That's how important they think it is. When the law is changed and allows them to do that, they put significant proportions into that. The Library of Rochdale was, 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 was amazing. Um, Karl Marx said the two best libraries he ever went to in the world were the British Museum and the Rochdale Pioneers Library. That's the level they were working to, to within there. So the movement that actually spread from Rochdale had this idea that this was a central part of, of what they did. <coughs> but there's also the challenge then of actually how did the movement evolve? Now obviously we, we, as it evolved rapidly with, with hundreds uh, indeed going on to the thousands of the societies, we actually saw that scale mattered to them. Property mattered hugely to, to the people of those early cult movements. It was a sign they had made progress, that they had gone from nothing to property ownership. And education shifted in many ways in that the same way. So the sign of success of education wasn't necessarily the depth of the education program, it was the quality of the cooperative hall. They would actually build and massively invest in significant educational facilities, which was a tremendous strength um, for them. Uh, but what you also tend to see though is actually the, to make these things work, then far more emphasis on social education, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, more social activities, etc. Nothing wrong with them 
you know, rather than always the formal learning parts uh, within there. And we saw the rise of other activities. You know, uh, David mentioned about international um, co-op um, celebrations. So the international cooperative um, that Dave fates uh, was always a, a central part of it. Uh, for any, I, or I came into the movement at the tail end of these. Uh, I always used to say yeah, it was an accurate description, apart from the fact they were never international, it was always local in there. There was very little sign of any form of cooperation in there, and it really was a fate worse than death in most uh, <laughs> cases. But, um, but therefore, the, the, it shifted as the resources became larger. The early pioneers' idea that social reform was the driver of education began to be lost, and it was a celebration and a coming together. And that's what the movement was doing. It was shifting from this idea of something you're directly controlling to something you're experiencing. Uh, no person ever put it better than Beatrice Webb. Uh, because when, in describing the movement by the time it had reached the 30s, uh, what she said uh, was they have descended into a movement of shopkeepers. Uh, and that's the challenge. And actually that big, broad vision that had been driven um, by that desire for education and social reform was beginning to sink into the operating of a, of a retail empire at a scale we probably struggle to imagine now. It's very hard for us to actually realise how influential that movement was there. But there were those that were willing to challenge. Uh, and, and none finer uh, than one of my great heroes, and it will probably come across a bit uh, in there, of Joseph Reeves. Um, I actually had the honour once of uh, meeting a, a woman then well into her 90s, Olive Davis, who had been the first ever female um, education officer in the cooperative movement in Enfield. Uh, and the one thing she wanted me to know was, you've got to learn about Joe Reeves. This is the man that made it possible. And she sort of handed his book over us, you've got to read this. And so Joe, incredibly important guy, Joe came to the Royal Arsenal Co-op in London uh, just after the First World War and stayed there till just before the Second World War and absolutely fundamentally reformed its approaches to education. Um, <coughs> A, a very deep and profound thinker around this one, but also an absolute doer. Yeah, a, a person that was constantly innovating new forms, adult education classes, the use of film. Uh, the cognitive movement in London, for instance, in the 1930s, was actually spending more per year on film than many Hollywood studios were. You know, the sheer scale of their education ambition was high. Uh, but Joe was very clear that we had to be careful what we meant by cognitive education. There was social education, which was about improving ourselves, our understanding, our appreciation of arts and, 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 and wider ones there, and that had a place. There was the education that let us understand, in a sense, the, the operations of our cooperative society. So what were we selling, what were we doing there? And then there was the stuff that mattered. He was asked by the, the COP Union, which obviously is now Cooptives UK, to um, consider were we going the right direction? Uh, and in a, in a wonderful pamphlet, one of which I treasure, called uh, Education for Social Change, he gives the answer. And the answer is no, we're fundamentally heading in the wrong direction. We're spending a lot of money on education, but most of it's being frittered away in his phrase, and literally his phrase, in fates, galas and bun fights. Mm -hmm. uh, you can probably recognise that today sometimes in, in some places. And so he said, well, so what is carb education for? And he said, we cannot educate without a purpose. And our purpose is to help people to understand the profound implications of cooperation. And that's an utterly wonderful phrase. And I hope when you're thinking about what your aspirations for the future, that doesn't get lost. This isn't about learning a few nice things about co-ops. This is actually about understanding how it changes people's lives, including our own. So all of his, his focus was on how do you get to the stage where people have gained that knowledge and applying it within in their lives itself. Um, so therefore, he's very clear, all our educational work should be undertaken with an object of preparing people for social change. Yeah, so this is part of that early vision, it's completely connecting back to that early stage there, and saying if we don't actually understand they're actually part of a, a radical movement seeking to actually do things differently, then we'll settle for second best within there. Um, so, so Reeves is a truly remarkable character for actually really saying strip it down and make sure this is happening. Nothing wrong with doing the other things, but if you're only doing the other things, you really aren't progressing as a cooperative. You're simply carrying out activities that somebody else could do. 
Now, I'm not going to go through every other British cooperator involved in education. I would love to do that. I haven't touched on the Cobb College because we've got Simon here who can do a far better job than I can there. What I would argue, though, is this thinking wasn't uniquely within the UK, that we see those approaches jumping up around the world, often independently um, as well. Let's just sort of take a few of those. Again, can't do justice to them all. Uh, this is Father Ares Mendy from the Bath region uh, in Spain, uh, seen here auditioning for The Matrix. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he was a, a priest in the Second World War. He'd seen the suppression of the Basque area um, un under Franco and realised that there was no hope of actually getting support from outside for the region. The only thing to do was to do it themselves. Um, so he set about trying to create a movement that would actually take social power um, to, to the people there. What's the first thing he did? He set up an education class. He set up a class for ordinary working people to actually look together and actually how does the world work, what were the challenges they were facing, and then to understand the role that cooperation mm -hmm. could play. The economic revolution will be moral or it will not be at all. The moral revolution will be economic or it will not be at all. So absolutely seeing this is not one, you do one thing one day and one thing the other, they weave in and out. And that, that ability to actually see the role of education as, as part of that one completely was woven into the success of Mondragon. So today when you actually see the successes of it as the biggest concentration of worker cooperation in the world, you don't just see the productive facilities of Mondragon, you see the educational facilities as well. It's universities, it's training, everything has actually gone to a scale. In fact, if you want to challenge your own cult, whatever that, those are, you know, perhaps one of the learnings is Mondragon developed their own set of values and principles you know, rather than simply uh, pasting up the ICA one. And they tried to present this in a diagram of what matters. And I think the one learning from today from that is what is at the centre of that model. So they're doing all these amazing things, all these productive parts there. They still, to this day, see education as the centre of, of how Mondragon will achieve what Mondragon will do. Now, now, I'd be remiss, um, and I uh, wouldn't want to, of missing out one key character of Sir Horace Plunkett. You'd expect that from the Plunkett Foundation, but he'd be there even if I wasn't in there. Horace Plunkett, the pioneer of Irish agricultural cooperation, creating over a thousand cooperatives in Ireland um, it, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, but again, a very distinctive view of actually how do you make progress um, on this. Um, so what he saw is that cooperation was an economic way of tackling Ireland's social issues. He saw it as the dawn of the practical, that uh, was how he put it. When he tried to explain to farmers what did they need to make a co-op work, he said there were three things. Better farming, better business and better living. A phrase he kept for all of his life for farming work. If you want to translate that into more broadly into co-op ones, he described it as this, technical, economic and social. To make your co-op work, you need to know how to run what you're going to do. If you're a farmer, you need the best possible farming knowledge to make that work. Econo by economic, he meant the model that will actually make your ideas work, and that model is being a cooperative. And the social, he meant that connection with your mission, that connection with your community, and making sure that your cooperative comes from and remains rooted in the values of that community <coughs> that you sought to have there. What he realised, though, as, as he developed those ideas, is that actually you can't assume all of those. What he'd found after about sort of, a couple of decades of working there was there was a failure at times. We kept dotting the map with new societies, most of which did make money, but too few of the members of the cooperative spirit. And when things went wrong, when times were bad, they were helpless. And what he'd realised was that better living was the crux. The other two, you never got started if you didn't have. But you could get started thinking you'd understood that cooperative spirit, but actually, and finding out too late that you didn't have it within there. So the role of the movement was ensuring there was proper support for developing that cooperative spirit. To so actually have educational programs, groups. Um, Hor Horace is practically one of the first in there to actually have separate groups of women to actually explore cooperative ideas to ensure they played a role in, in Irish society organisations still exist today. Um, so the real challenge is how do we embed that cooperative spirit rather than take it for granted? And I think taking it for granted is often one of our, our biggest challenges. 
Uh, other very quick examples of you know, people seeing that link between education, Charles Guidet, uh, the man who, one of the key figures of developing the international movement, his early cooperative, pro, um, early cooperative groupings were literally called the School of Nimes. So literally is that the language of education was being used for the cooperatives he was starting to form. Um, and another uh, highly influential character, Moses Cody in, and the, in the uh, eastern coast of Canada, um, again, a, a Catholic priest, Jesuit, um, here, again, had a very specific program about how you created change in the communities he was working with. And that was you started by having preliminary study groups to actually come together, understand the world, the challenges within it, what you wanted to change, and then go on to form cooperatives. That same bit one in there, the understanding of the education comes first, and then you actually take action uh, within there. So another key educational figure. So we've got this wonderful rich tradition that says, if you don't actually educate to understand the implications of cooperation, then your cooperatives will fail. What do we find in the world today? Well, the ICA, um, sorry, Eurixi did a, a survey for the ICA in, in, in the International Year of Co-ops that found this. When they asked a group of experts to indicate the three principles that in their opinion are often uh, more intensely unfulfilled by cooperatives, education was one of those three. The other two were also the softer ones, the cooperation between cooperatives, which often comes from education, and the commitment to community. So there is something fundamentally wrong in so many parts of the movement of actually not realising both that wonderful heritage but also the importance within there. Uh, and so what I hope can come from today um, is actually that desire to do that. Why do we fail so often? Well, it's a lovely Buddhist phrase that, for me that often summarises it, of a fish is the last to understand water. Because we actually have our cooperative name above the door, we so often forget that should actually be earned, not simply placed there. And actually thinking through what are the programmes, what are the activities that can inspire our current leaders, our current members, and our future leaders and our future members, to me there is no more important purpose within the movement. Um, Horace Plunkett was very clear that when a, co when a cocktail had actually lost that connection, he described it as simply whirring on to, disrupt, uh, um, dis um, to destruction. So for me, I hope today we can rise to that challenge there. Wells has got such a wonderful tradition of focusing on individual issues and taking them forward. I do hope that education can be one, but I believe there's no more important challenge in the world today in our movement than ensuring we understand those implications of cooperation. So I hope that gets you going. Thanks ever so much. Weakness came at the time of strength, that when you actually saw the economic power in the 1930s, that's when the, the astute observers of the movement also realised its weakness. We'd forgotten that we were a movement of social reform and had simply become a movement of economic success. That had left us weakened, so by the time we get to the 60s, when economically our model gets challenged, it's got nowhere to go. Um, so to me, it's a movement gently losing its purpose, descending into a movement of shopkeepers. Um, so for me, the, the strong movements are the ones that constantly refresh their, their purpose. Why are they there? What are they trying to, to achieve? Um, rather than simply yeah, echoing the, we're very big, we're very successful. So to me, that's what was lost then. Uh, I think there were numerous opportunities to actually reinvigorate that. Um, I'm a great one for believing it's, it's never lost, we can keep, keep trying within there. Uh, but you just see this around the world, once people forget who they are, then, they, then the, the movement eventually will start to diminish. <coughs> Where do they learn who they are? They learn that through genuine cooperative education.